Welcome to your Canadians Connection on Rocket Sports Radio. We are proud to be the trusted source for all things Habs for more than a decade. This is the Canadians Connection Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Canadians Connection Podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio, keeping you informed, engaged, and entertained. My name is Michael Spinella, and I'll be your host for the next hour. This is episode 274 of the Canadians Connection Podcast, and I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by my co-host, the editor of the Hockey News Montreal, and the founder and the president of Rocket Sports, Mr. Rick Stevens. And Rick, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. Uh, and hope you're doing well, too. We're just uh, just over a week from Christmas and um, some interesting things happening around the NHL and certainly with the Montreal Canadiens. Um, but we're wondering, where's, where's Goal Caulfield? Where is that Goal Caulfield gone? That's a good question. I have referred to him as the greatest 40 goal scorer to not score 40 goals <laughs> quite yet. And uh, I don't know. I've I've not seen a whole lot of him. Uh, there was a lot of talk of him scoring big overtime goals at the beginning of the year. But uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll chat about that at some point today, won't we? I think so. I think we'll touch on it a few times in this podcast. But uh, we do have a pretty big episode uh, planned out for everyone. Uh, we'll get you up to date on everything Montreal Canadiens, uh, the games from this past week, roster updates, we'll take a look at the prospects, and then some news from around the NHL. In segment two, uh, we are going to welcome our medical consultant, Dr. Stephen Morris, to the show. Back by popular demand, we have some questions for him and uh, some listener questions to ask to him, so make sure you stick around for that. And then in segment three, it's the Have Your Say segment. Our Canadians Connection question of the week is, did you say 40 goals? How about can Cole Caulfield hit the 20 goal mark this season? So nice and spicy. We want to make sure that we hear from all of our listeners. And uh, Rick, what's the best way for them to reach out to us? Well, heat up our text line, uh, 5853ROCKET. Our Rocket Sports text line is 5853ROCKET. If you got a little more to say, send us an email. You can reach us at hello at rocketsportsmedia.com. Uh, That's hello at rocketsportsmedia.com. And you can follow us on social media. Just follow at Habs Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and check out the website, canadiansconnection.fm. Uh, make sure that you check out our comprehensive uh, pre-game previews and post-game recaps for every Canadians game at thn.com slash Montreal. And here's what's happened since we've been gone. If we want to go all the way back to December the 9th, uh, Montreal pays a visit to Buffalo. They come away with a shootout victory. Uh, Slavkovsky scored a very nice shootout goal uh, to win that one. Uh, Jaden Struble and uh, Nick Suzuki gave Montreal a 2-0 lead heading into that third period. But Buffalo battles back to tie it. Uh, after the win, uh, Caden Primo's record... Uh, it got better to 3-3-0. Three, three and oh. uh, So nice to see Montreal coming away with a, a win in the shootout and Caden uh, Primo actually getting a solid game under his belt as well. I thought Caden Primo was his best in the first period um, and it was uh, being outshot. So the Canadians were outshot. I think it was 17-7. Lots of high danger opportunities for the Sabres and um, I think that really built uh, Primo's confidence and uh, faltered maybe a little bit later, but um, he was uh, he, it was a good solid win for him. Um, and Slavkovsky um, with the the uh, shootout winner and a fight. Um, are we going to be talking about a fight a little bit later? Yeah, we'll save that uh, for a little <laughs> bit later and we'll have some fun with it. Uh, it was a back-to-back -back that weekend on December the 10th. Uh, Nashville comes to Montreal, and they come away with a 2-1 to -one victory. Jake Allen had the start. He looked pretty solid. Uh, I don't think that he let any goals that he would like to have back. Uh, it was really just the Colton Sisson show for Nashville. He scored two. Uh, Habs go over 5 on the power play. Jake Evans with the lone Montreal goal. So 2-1. to -one. Montreal really struggled to get offense going in that. 30 saves for Jake Allen, you mentioned him, um, but he's just not getting any kind of run support. Um, in the last, uh, J uh, in Jake Allen's last seven starts, uh, the Canadians have scored just uh, 14 goals, so uh, not getting the help he needs, uh, but as you said, solid in this game. 
With a few days off in between to reflect, uh, Montreal returned to action on the 13th of December, and they lose in the shootout to the Pittsburgh Penguins 4-3. to three. Uh, Goals from David Savard, uh, his uh, he scored in his return to the lineup almost immediately. Uh, Jaden Struble scored his second career NHL goal. And Sean Monahan on the power play all in the first period. Uh, the Habs were up 3-1, to one, but the Pens fire back to tie it up 3-3. to three, And it would remain that way until the 12th round of the shootout. The second shot, Jansen Harkins for the Penguins ended that. And boy, that was a long game. Uh, Rick, I think you had me working overtime on that one. <laughs> Through the, the 12 uh, rounds of the shootouts, um, you and Gustav were tremendous hosting a live stream. Um, and a lot of Habs fans uh, joined in and kept uh, the, the stream kept building as the game went on. It was a thrilling game um, and, and lots of fun. Uh, David Savard was a buzzsaw in the first period. Um, of the first four shots, David Savard had three of them, and one of those was a goal. Um, it was it was a fun game uh, to join you on on the live uh, on the live stream uh, and watch that. And uh, we got another one coming up uh, this coming week that we'll tell uh, our listeners about a little bit later. So the Canadians' record is currently twelve, thirteen, and four. That's twenty eight points and twenty second in the NHL. Taking a look at injuries, David Savard did return to the lineup versus Pittsburgh. Uh, like I said, he scored a goal, and I think he had one of his better games as a Montreal Canadian. And uh, with that happening, uh, Matthias Norlander was loaned back to the Laval Rocket. Uh, with defensemen coming back from injury, that felt pretty unavoidable. Yeah, and it, a, a little unfortunate that uh, Norlander didn't get into the lineup um, and uh, just was around uh, for practices and and I, I thought he um, should have at least been tossed an opportunity uh, while he was with the team. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, more defensemen could be coming back pretty soon. Uh, Jordan Harris continues to rehab and is expected to return to play in uh, about 10 to 14 days. He's missed about 10 games so far, so it'd be nice to get him back. Uh, I think that he's had a bit of an up and down season so far, to be honest, but uh, if he can get back to his form from last year, then this will be a, a huge win for the Montreal Canadiens. Absolutely. Uh, Canadians forward Tanner Pearson is going to be out four to six weeks with an upper body injury. He suffered the injury against Buffalo last Saturday. Yeah, it was in that first period of, of the uh, Buffalo game. Uh, he took a puck off of his hand, and immediately um, you you worried because we remember uh, it was Pearson's right hand um, that was hit um, uh, in, in uh, a year ago when he was with Vancouver, had a couple of surgeries, and it all kind of went wrong. Uh, this time it was it was his left hand. Um, uh, sorry, um, right hand. The last uh, last time was his left hand. Anyway, um, different hands. Not that it makes it better, but uh, we worried about that, given that it was uh, surgically repaired. And as a result, the Canadians recalled Emil Heineman from the Laval Rocket. He's yet to play a game. He was scratched against Pittsburgh. Yeah, it's um, uh, hoping that that Heineman um, gets into the lineup. No lineup changes uh, for the Saturday night game against the Islanders. Uh, so Heineman won't be uh, won't be in the lineup. Um, I, I we remember Heineman. He he had a bit of a slow start to uh, uh, training camp. Um, he had a bit of a chat with Adam Nicholas, um, who said just you know put things behind, play your game, don't think too much. And then he was tremendous. Uh, he looked pretty good when on the top line in uh, in some of those exhibition games. Um, but then he got injured, um, and it was, it was a bizarre, um, injury where, uh, he collided with the referee. Um, and anyway, um, when he came back to, uh, Laval, he's been very, very good and certainly deserved, uh, his first call up to the NHL. The Edmonton Oilers continue to scout the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, they seemed to be scouting goalies uh, not too long ago, and it was quite intensely. Uh, but they appear to be back. And uh, Rick, uh, what do you think is going on here? Yeah, I think um, that that they're still interested in in uh, Canadians products. Um, but uh, the word is they they might be keeping an eye on Josh Anderson, Christian Dvorak. Um, they've they've kind of left the the, the goaltending. Um, 
a loan and uh, and maybe are looking at a forward this time. And now it's time to get to our winners and losers. And now it's time for this week's winners and losers on the Canadians Connection. So we're feeling pretty generous. We have the holidays coming up soon, so no losers this time. Uh, just a couple of winners uh, celebrating two JSs and some firsts. I'll start this one off. My winner for this week, Yuri Slavkovsky. Uh, in the game against Buffalo last Saturday, he had his very first NHL fight. Uh, this one was against Clifton. Uh, I've never seen Slavkovsky look so strong on his feet. He looked very <laughs> difficult to try and bring down. That's exactly what you want to see from him. I think the fight all in all was pretty even, but uh, Slavkovsky at the end did end up on top. And I will also mention a beautiful shootout goal to win that one. So Slavkovsky does get the last laugh overall. And uh, we do have some audio from Yuri Slavkovsky uh, talking about his first NHL fight. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a good win. And yeah, we just keep going tomorrow. Yeah, it doesn't matter how my face is looking. <laughs> they, they just said you took some lessons from Arbor. Uh, is that yeah, yeah, but to be honest, I, as soon as it started, I blacked out and I didn't really think about anything. I was just going forward. It's real. It's yeah, my first time, so yeah. Um, a great quote. He didn't want to talk too much about his shootout goal. He's more proud of his fight, I think. Although I, I, I liked him saying, you know, he had quite a tag. He had quite a mark uh, on his cheek. And, and he said, uh, yeah, we're just going to go back to work tomorrow. It doesn't matter what my face looks like. And uh, really didn't have much. Yes, I took lessons from uh, Arbor Jackai, but I really didn't have a strategy. I just kind of blacked out and uh, uh, as the fight began. So um that, that's a lot of fun, and, and he seemed to really enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. I love that uh, he is very honest about it and just blacking out and not really knowing what happened there. Same thing probably would happen to any of us, so very understandable. And with that, uh, Rick, I'll let you have your winner of the week. Yeah, it's uh, one Jaden Struble, who um, I think has been a little bit of a, a surprise for many um, Canadians fans. Um, he has played 11 games um, already in the NHL, um, two goals, one assist for three points, uh, showing that he, he does have a little bit of offense to his game. Um, <clears throat> and I think that uh, this goal um, against uh, the Buffalo Savers was, was pretty special to him um, uh, because he was facing a Northeastern teammate um, in uh, goaltender Devin Levi. And let's hear from him. That was crazy. I mean, I, even pregame skate, I made a joke to him, like, I'm going to score my first against you. And uh, so it was just crazy how it worked out like that. But um, I mean, just happy to see him having the success he's having, too. And uh, yeah, it was a special night for sure. So that's uh, where he got his, his first against uh, um, Devin Levi, both uh, Northeastern alums and uh, just a lot of fun there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, he did go on to score his second NHL goal just a few games later. So Jaden Struble, he's looked great, a great skater too. I've liked what I've seen from him, and uh, I guess we'll find out uh, how long he's able to stay up with the big club. And with that, uh, I think it's a good time to get to our Habs Prospect Report. It's time for the Rocket Report. The Rocket Sports Media team is your premier source for information about the Laval Rocket the AHL affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens, as well as Habs prospects playing in the CHL, NCAA, and leagues around the world. Bookmark THN.com slash Montreal to follow our comprehensive coverage of Canadiens prospects. Each week we like to highlight a Montreal Canadiens prospect, and this week we will shine the spotlight on Clarkson University goaltender Emmett Croto. Uh, so he was a sixth round pick in 2022. He's a goaltender. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the three goaltenders picked in the most recent draft, but uh, we haven't really uh, talked about the guy picked in the draft just before. So I figured it was time to check in. Uh, he's 20 years old currently and in uh, three appearances made so far this season, he's 1-2-0, uh, 275 goals against average, and a .871 save percentage. So we've not seen a ton of him, but uh, I think there's still maybe a little bit of potential. Uh, what are your thoughts on Emmett Croto? Yeah, well, we remember he's um, he's just a freshman in the NCAA. Uh, he spent three years uh, in the USHL with the Waterloo Blackhawks, 
so he's uh, second uh, to Austin Roden um, in the in the net for Clarkson. Uh, Roden playing eleven games. Uh, Emma Croto um, with uh, just three games, but um, has uh, you know I, I think he's as we've talked about before. Um, it's learning, uh, learning and being exposed to a higher level of, of competition and, uh, Clarkson university is, um, is having a good season and, uh, uh, they are in the, of course, the ECAC of the NCAA, uh, they are second to Quinnipiac as, as we speak. So he's going to be facing some tough teams. He's got some good talent around him and we'll just keep an eye on, uh, watching how his, the rest of his season progresses and how many opportunities he gets so let's also take a peek at uh, brantford bulldogs winger florian jackai uh that's younger jackai brother picked in the most recent draft he's having a pretty good season uh 25 points in 28 games and 31 penalty minutes it looks like so it's nice to see that uh, this pick is starting to look pretty good i think there were some doubts about what his abilities were i don't think anyone predicted that he'd be this good offensively right no, uh, I, I don't. I don't think so. Um, he has. He, he's on a point streak as well. In the last one five games, he has seven assists, um, and uh, you know that's that's great for for him. Uh, helping up uh, the Brantford Bulldogs um, is uh, you know he could be um, close to a, a sixty point player. Uh, in the OHL and and as well there's that that physical side of him Um, so he's going to be an interesting prospect to keep an eye on absolutely last week we talked about uh, the world uh, junior championships and some of the initial I guess roster picks the teams were making well it's now final team Canada will have Owen Beck for the United States it's going to be Lane Hudson and Jacob Fowler and very nice to see that Jacob Fowler gets to be on that team. Uh, I think a lot of people are expecting him to be the backup to one Trey Augustine, who spent uh, last uh, World Juniors as the starting goaltender for Team USA. But I think Jacob Fowler believes there's some competition, and uh, we have some audio from him about that. Yeah, so I think we're roommates here, so it's uh, it's always been a lot of fun. But you know, I think I think it's a blessing for both of us to be here, and you know, him and I are going to push each other and. You know, I think it's the best of both worlds because him and I are here both for the same reason. And, you know, no matter who's in the net, we both have the same goal to win a gold medal. So him and I are going to push each other, you know, the whole tournament and especially here. So it'll be a lot of fun to do it. And, you know, can't wait to be standing next to him with a gold medal around our necks. That's um, it, it's it's a friendly way of saying I'm here and I'm going to compete with you. Um, Trey Augustine is the incumbent, given his experience uh, at last year's uh, world juniors. Um, but Fowler has had an excellent season, as we've said, um, fascinating that they're, they're roommates. Um, and, um, you know, Jacob Fowler is, is seeing it as, as kind of a friendly competition. Um, and, uh, that they're going to both, um, it, it's going to help make the team better. It's going to help make them better. Um, so that they can push, push, push each other. And, and, uh, the, with the end result, um, they're hoping, uh, standing, uh, next to each other with a gold medal around their neck. Um, very positive, um, I think. Um, and that, uh, as you said, we, we talked about preliminary rosters last week. Um, those rosters have been finalized. The U S uh, USA roster, uh, just being finalized, uh, Saturday morning, uh, as we record now, we didn't have um, any worry that Lane Hudson would be there. Of course, he's he's there, and uh, there was no worry that uh, Owen Beck uh, would be there. Owen said uh, in his interview, in his uh, media availability, Owen said that the first call he made was uh, to his mom and dad, obviously, when um, he found out that he made the team, um, and that his parents are going to Sweden um, to, uh, to watch him play, uh, in person. So, uh, awfully nice there. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, just one more that, uh, made, uh, their national team, that would be Philippe Michard for Team Slovakia. I don't think there's too many surprises about that one either, right, Rick? No, he's having a terrific season, uh, in Kitchener, um, and, uh, will be, a, a play a really important role for that Slovakia team. So now we'll take a look at the Laval Rocket from this past week, Montreal's AHL affiliate. 
And uh, they actually had a winning week despite only two games uh, going back to December 9th. Uh, Hartford comes to town and Laval with a very rare, very dominant game winning five to one. Uh, Riley Kidney leads the way with two goals, uh, three Laval goals in the second period to lead the way to victory. And then on the 15th of December, Laval goes to visit Lehigh Valley and kind of a crazy game. A uh, great game for one Jakob Dobas. Uh, he faced 45 shots from the Phantoms. Laval only putting 24 shots on the other net. Uh, Laval erased a 3-2 lead for the Phantoms to win 4-3. to And just a crazy game overall. Uh, Rick, what did you think about that one? Well, it was it was just a, a great week, and and you said that dominating win uh, that they had over a very good Hartford team. Um, it was clear that they the Rocket were riding a nine game uh, losing streak. It was clear that they didn't want to go to double digits on that, and uh, and were un uh, you know were relent, relentless in that game. Riley Kidney playing uh, a large role there, um, and. Uh, again, um, on Friday night uh, in Lehigh Valley in Allentown, um, it was it was Riley Kidney playing a, a, a major role. Um, Jan, Jan Mishak tied the game. Uh, Riley Kidney with the the game winner uh, against the Phantoms and uh, brings him to to six goals um, this season. Uh, but remember, he had a really slow start. Uh, so he's had three goals in his last uh, two games. Um, and is, uh, if you look at the past three games, uh, you're looking at five points. So, uh, he's getting on a bit of a roll. Um, and Jakob Dobas, yeah, he was outstanding. Um, and, and has had a really good week. Um, and, uh, um, you know, faced some, some, uh, I think a little bit of criticism, but has worked hard, um, and really looked excellent um, as as uh, Lehigh Valley was all over Laval at some points in that game. Um, and there was Jakob Dobas making two saves and three saves and four saves in a row. Um, he was incredible. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, Laval's record is currently 7-12, 3-2. Uh, the points percentage is 3-9-6, and that's 29th in the AHL. Three games coming up uh, in the next week for Laval. On the 16th of December, they will visit Hershey. On the 20th, they will visit Syracuse. And then on the 22nd, they are back home uh, to host the Wilkes-Barre, Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins. Uh, taking a look, one more league down to the ECHL. Uh, Montreal's affiliate there, the Trois-Rivières Lions. They've had a losing week. Uh, <laughs> I think they had an amazing start to the season where they seemed unbe- unbeatable. But uh, certainly coming back down to earth, if we want to go back to December the 9th, uh, they visit Reading. They lose 5-1. to one. Uh, They have a couple games at home on the 13th. Uh, Norfolk comes to visit, uh, and they lose 4-3. to three. And on the 15th, uh, Norfolk uh, remain in Trois-Rivières, and they win again 4-1. to one. So three losses for the Lions this past week. It uh, looks like Joe Verbetics may be struggling a little bit more. Uh, perhaps some lineup changes. Uh, they're not having that same consistency that they had at the beginning of the year. So with that, the record 13-10, 0-0. That's sixth place in the Eastern Conference. And I think they are 3-7 and seven in their last uh, 10 games. Um, and yes, they've... They've had some players um, called up to Laval to, to uh, uh, as injury replacements or players who have gone up to um, uh, the Canadians. So uh, they're, they're definitely struggling right now. Uh, some news coming from the QMJHL. The league announced on Thursday it will be known as the Quebec Maritimes Junior Hockey League, previously known as the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. I think this makes a lot of sense and uh, probably been a little while coming since this league features both Quebec and the Maritimes. Um, the league commissioner, uh, we know he's a, a new commissioner, Mario, Mario Caccini, uh, took over the position in May and said um, that this was one of his big priorities uh, to recognize the the presence of the Maritimes and how important the Maritimes are. Um, six Maritime teams in the league, um, and and the QMJHL has had a team in the Maritimes for um, almost 30 years. It was the Halifax Mooseheads first. Um, and, uh, and has gone on from there. So uh, this makes a lot of sense, as you, as you said. 
Uh, they've also released uh, for the very first time an English version of the league's logo. Um, so they're making some changes and, uh, and I think very positive. Yep, absolutely. And uh, brand new on the THN website for QMJHL, uh, we have a brand new article. And uh, Rick, uh, what can you tell us about this? I believe this is still Jeremy that's been uh, writing all these fantastic articles for us. For sure. Uh, we've got, uh, and, and we should, um, a- Amy contributes uh, an article a week. Um, I write something from the QMJHL archives. Um, and Jeremy has been busy uh, both covering the the trade period and and going team to team and talking to general managers, uh, or in this case, he talks about the seven players um, who will be uh, representing uh, their countries at the World Junior Championships. So we're we're just talking about World Juniors. Uh, the Q will be well represented there. And if you want to find out uh, who they are and a little bit about them, you head to uh, thn.com/qmjhl. So if you want to find all of our content on Canadians prospects, you can go to THN.com slash Montreal. And if you want to find the best English language coverage of the Quebec Maritimes Junior Hockey League, you can go to THN.com slash QMJHL. And now it's time to get to our quotes of the week. To start things off, uh, Marty St. Louis, uh, he's talking about what does Cole have to do on his to end his slump? For me, like like the rest of our group, you got to get on the inside. That's it. You know, and I, I don't know how many games I went. I know I'm sure I went a long time, too. But, um, you know, to me, it's you you, you, you got to find ways to get on the inside with and without the puck. So he was asked about uh, Cole Slump. Um, and, and he, you know, he thought about his own experience, how many games uh, that he went uh, without scoring a goal, um, and, and, uh, the remedy, um, he, you heard him very clearly wants, uh, Cole Caulfield and wants all of his players, uh, to get to the inside, uh, and, uh, and not be, um, uh, such a perimeter player. And with that, uh, we have some audio where, uh, we asked, or someone was asking, uh, Cole Caulfield if, uh, going to the inside would help him and his slump. Yeah, I think uh, you know everybody can obviously improve on that. Um, I think myself personally I could get on the inside more, and it's it's not really net front presence it's about arriving on the inside and um, kind of surprising the other team uh, when you come in. But um, I think you can always be around the net more. Um, you know, you're flying by, getting the rebounds and, and loose pucks that way too. So um, I think it's all about timing and, and kind of getting more on the inside. So Cole answered the question. I'm not sure he answered it the way that Marty St. Louis had in mind. Uh, it doesn't sound like he's going to change his game, he said. And, and fair, fair enough, Cole Caulfield's um, role or the way he's been successful isn't to be a net front presence to deflect pucks, to screen the goaltender. That's not his game. He framed it as, um, as arriving at the net uh, at the right time uh, for rebounds and whatnot. Um, but as said in his usual, you know, Caulfield um, usually keeps things pretty canned, uh, very, very monotone, uh, very unemotional. Um, and so he, he kind of just goes along with it and then frames it in his own um, fashion. Yeah, absolutely. And our final quote here, also from Cole Caulfield, uh, being asked uh, about his mental state while going through this slump. I mean, obviously, you just think the next one's going to go in. I think that's kind of the only way you can look at it. And, you know, the more chance they get, you know, you know hopefully it goes in. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you just have to remain in the mindset that, that your next shot is going to go in. Um, he's had, a, he's led, he's leading the, the team with, um, it's over 100 shots. Um, he's had a huge volume of shots. Um, and so, you know, his mindset just has to be that, his next shot is going to go in the net. Um, and I think that's pretty positive. Yeah, so I'd say keep all those quotes in mind as we go into that second segment because I think some of those will come back. Uh-huh. Uh, going on to some news from around the NHL, uh, the St. Louis Blues have fired he- head coach Craig Berube and named Drew Bannister their interim coach. Uh, Craig Berube this season, 13-12-1 was his record. He's been the head coach of the St. Louis Blues since their cup-winning year in 2018. Um, Not a big surprise to you, I know that. Well, he was, um, I had 
chosen Craig Berube as uh, my first coach uh, to be fired, there was a a poll of all the um, hockey news site editors um, at uh, pr- prior to the start of the season. My vote was cr- for Craig Berube uh, being fired, um, and and maybe it was delayed a little bit because the the Blues actually haven't been that bad um, this season, um, but had a, a losing streak. And uh, Doug Armstrong um, uh, finally uh, pulled the trigger. Um, it. You know, I, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, fan support for the Chief, as he's called. Um, Craig Berube uh, led the Blues to their only Stanley Cup title. Um, and the fans kind of uh, got into a, a, a bit of a, you know, a, a, well, I, I didn't like what happened to Jordan Cairo, probably their best uh, player. Um, and uh, St. Louis, and, and he, he wanted to stay out of the, um, the, the controversy. And, and so he just said, uh, Craig Berube was no longer his coach and it, it came out bad. It, it just, it didn't sound right. Probably not how he meant it. Um, and, uh, f- the fans booed him and then he was very emotional afterwards, um, in the, in the post game scrum. So, uh, I, I thought that whole situation was kind of unfortunate this week. Yeah, definitely. And we did have a trade go down uh, not too long ago. Uh, the Colorado Avalanche have traded Thomas Tatar to the Seattle Kraken for a fifth-round pick in 2024. Uh, Tatar this season, one goal and nine points through 27 games. So his offense certainly looks like it's slowing down quite a bit. Uh, the Kraken, I think, could use some depth scoring, so maybe a change of scenery would help him out. But uh, former uh, Habs forward, uh, not have not off to a good start to to his season and uh, hoping for some improvement there. Now, will Thomas Tatar get to play with one Shane Wright? Uh, Cause the Seattle Kraken announced this week that they had recalled Shane Wright from Coachella Valley. And ending the segment on a bit of a more difficult note, on Friday it was announced an 11-year-old hockey player in St. Eustache died a few days after being struck by a puck in the throat during practice. So just uh, sad uh, for the whole community there. That's uh, very difficult and uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, we are thinking about them. Very, very tragic um, accident. And uh, our sincere condolences go out to uh, his family, his friends, and, and certainly his teammates. So uh, we'll uh, end the segment there. Uh, coming up, we will hear from our sponsors, DraftKings, and then we'll get to our big topic segment uh, where we welcome Dr. Stephen Morris to the show. Stay with us. This is the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. Bet the action on the ice with DraftKings Sportsbook. You know, it's hockey season once again. And although I love using DraftKings Sportsbook to, I don't know, enhance and make more fun my NFL watching week to week, it's even more fun when you get in on the action with the NHL and DraftKings Sportsbook. Uh, Whether it's daily fantasy, whether it's uh, same game parlays that you're doing on Sportsbook, or whether you're just placing straight up money line bets, DraftKings Sportsbook makes it fun and easy for you to bet the action on the ice. So download the app now and use code THPN. New customers can get 150 bucks instantly in bonus bets for betting just $5 on hockey. Now that's code THPN only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. The crown is yours. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. NHL and the NHL Shield are registered trademarks of the National Hockey League. Copyright NHL 2023. All rights reserved.
Welcome back to the Canadians Connection Podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. I'm Michael Spinella. You can find me on Twitter at the Spinella. With me in the studio is our president and founder of Rocket Sports, Rick Stevens. You can follow him on Twitter at Rocket Sports. You can also follow this podcast at Habs Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can check out the website, CanadiansConnection.fm. Just a reminder here to subscribe to the Canadians Connection podcast in the player or on your favorite podcast app. That way you never miss a single episode. And in just a few minutes, uh, we will be joined in the studio by Rocket Sports uh, medical consultant, Dr. Stephen Morris. Uh, Dr. Morris has has an established medical practice uh, with a background in muscle physiology and human biomechanics. Uh, this will be his second appearance on the show. We're uh, pleased to, to regularly feature Stephen on the Canadians Connection podcast. Um, he helps us dis- uh, discuss medical issues, performance issues um, regarding uh, the Montreal Canadians. And um, as you said, uh, this, is, this will be his second visit with us. Uh, Dr. Morris last joined us on episode 266, uh, episode 266 of the Canadians Connection podcast. And at that point, we're discussing the season ending, season ending injury to Kirby Doc and then his subsequent surgery. Um, so last week, uh, we asked our listeners um, to submit questions uh, to Dr. Morris, and we got a ton of questions. Thank you for all the questions. Um, there were a lot of them, but, uh, the ones that rose to the top, the ones that, uh, we received, uh, the most questions about, um, were the injury of Alex Newhook and the performance of Cole Caulfield. And I would like to introduce Dr. Stephen Morris to the show. Stephen Morris is our medical uh, consultant for Rocket Sports. Um, He's a medical doctor training with the Royal Australian College of General Practice with an advanced degree in muscle physiology and human biomechanics. Uh, We have him on the podcast periodically just to reach out and get some general information and consult him on various things. Uh, He's actually back on today's show by popular demand. Our listeners have been asking about him. They reached out uh, with quite a few questions. And uh, how are you doing today? Mr. Uh, Stephen Morris, or doctor, should I say? <laughs> I'm good, Michael. Thank you very much for the uh, for that amazing introduction. It's like uh, you made it yourself. And uh, yeah. Rick, how are you as well? Uh, doing well. Um, no aches or pains or anything to report since the last time. So, and that's <laughs> that's not why you're here. Uh, I'm doing great, and uh, we're thrilled to have you back again. As Michael said, uh, we had a great reaction to. Uh, your first uh, appearance on the podcast. We had a great discussion about uh, Kirby Doc, and for those who missed that, you want to go back and and search at uh, CanadiansConnection.fm, and we're looking forward to you um, answering uh, some of the viewer questions or listener questions um, about Canadians players today. Yeah, and uh, I believe there's a little bit of a disclaimer that we wanted to put in just before we get into all the meat and material. Well, listen, um, it's it's Dr. Morris is uh, has uh, considerable expertise, um, but it's not as if he has met with these players. It's not as if he's uh, seen their files. He's going to rely on on his own medical knowledge, which is quite extensive. Um, his experience and um, and publicly available um, information uh, to have a you know an intelligent conversation uh, about what is going on with the players we're going to be talking about. So starting things off, uh, we did have a couple of players that uh, we were asked about quite a bit. Um, the first one we want to talk to you about is one Alex Newhook. Uh, Alex Newhook was injured on November the 30th in a game versus the Florida Panthers. Uh, he crashed into the net in the third period and was actually had to be helped off the ice. Uh, Newhook was uh, then diagnosed with a high ankle sprain. On December the 2nd, the Canadians announced that he would be out of the lineup uh, for about 10 to 12 weeks. So I wanted to talk to you about that. And uh, first things first here, what exactly is a high ankle sprain? Thank you, Mike. Uh, look, the um, the high ankle sprain is a term that gets thrown around, um, but actually can mean a couple of things. Um, in, in this case, just to sort of give some context, you know, the ankle itself is made up of where our lower leg meets um, the foot and sort of allows us to uh, walk and do all sorts of movements with the lower end of the leg. 
Um, it's made up of two bones of the leg, which is the tibia, which is actually the bigger bone of the leg, and the one that we can probably feel if you just put your hand down, and then the fibula, which is sort of on the outside of the leg and a bit smaller, um, and where they connect to what's called the talus, the bone of the foot. Um, so really, like, the important thing to know before we go into what is an ankle sprain is uh, the fact that the ankle itself has, it, you know, to keep its stability like any other joint in the body, it has a series of these um, fibrous bands that are called ligaments that hold it together and basically allow forces to be applied to the joint uh, and not the joint not come apart. And it can come apart, you know, in a number of areas, uh, whether it's where the talus or the foot meets the lower limb itself, um, or whether it's the two bones of the lower limb, the uh, tibia and the fibula, coming apart. And in a high ankle sprain, it's really an injury to the fibrous bands of those ligaments that are holding the um, that joint together. But particularly in the case of probably most high ankle sprains is uh, the anterior inferior tibia fibula ligament, which is otherwise known as the AITFL. And that stops the tibia and the fibula, the two bones of the leg, actually coming apart. And so it takes a lot of strain and a lot of um, force on it when those when those two bones are pulled apart by shearing forces from skating, for example, or falling in the wrong way. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later about uh, why that applies to Alex. But you know, you mentioned in your in your intro that he crashed into the net and he and that was what caused the injury. But I was actually rewatching the video and he has two incidences that actually lead to the injury, both with the exact mechanisms of a high ankle sprain. So the first one is he actually falls backwards onto his left leg and the leg is twisted out and then the toes are sort of pointed a bit towards the head and that's called external rotation and dorsiflexion. Um, in addition to that, he tries to play and then he goes and crashes into the net and has what's called hyper dorsiflexion of the foot and both of those can result in strain on those ligaments and the high ankle sprain itself. So uh, my next question for you, um, why can a sprain actually be worse than a fracture in terms of the time of return? So I think the answer to this is best put in two ways. Um, the number one is as a consequence of just tissue repair. So like the body, the musculoskeletal, the body is made up of um, sort of a couple of main components, muscle, right? Um, ligaments, which we just talked about. Uh, tendons and bone and that really comprises the building blocks of our musculoskeletal system and the way that those things remodel are all different um, so when you injure one of one of them whether it's bone or muscle or ligament they repair differently and it's because of not only blood supply but sort of the native things that live inside of those tissues a bone um, when it repairs the things that are inside the bone uh, the cells that are inside the bone they can form a little uh, what's called a bony callus um, and help repair the bone from the inside um, using these cells called osteoblasts or fibroblasts um, and really it can happen pretty quickly it has a pretty generous blood supply any help that it needs from the rest of the body can get there pretty easily um, the thing about a ligament is it doesn't have the same native structures that help it repair as robustly and it also has a much more poor blood supply so when I ask the body for help, whether that's through inflammatory markers or immune-mediated response, it doesn't repair as quickly or as well. And in some cases, not at all. You know, look at um, Kirby Doc, for example. We talked about why is he even getting an ACL repair. It's because it's not going to fix itself. It has to be put back together, unlike a bone, which if it's lined up properly, will fix itself. The other issue with um, the ligament and why an ankle sprain might be, or high ankle sprain might be worse than a, than a fracture is because of the functional requirement of that system. And so when you look at a bone, I mean, what do you do with a bone really? You, especially in your leg, you stand on it and it bears your weight and it goes up and down and it's a pretty rigid structure. But the, the ligaments, as I talked about in my introduction, you know, they, they prevent shear forces in multiple directions. And so what we require of the ligament is actually a much greater, um, a much greater task in a lot of ways, especially in the, in the setting of skating, um, than maybe we would require from a bone. So we can come back a bit earlier from a bone injury and it's easier to fix versus a ligament's much higher requirement. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, my final question in regard to this is uh, what if, uh, if any, are the long-term effects of this and is there a risk of re-injury? Uh, I think you know we've we've talked we've talked before about Kirby and and any injury. I think there's always when you when you have an injury, there's always going to be a re-risk injury, uh, re-injury risk. 
Um, but I, I, there was a study in 2019 um, of NHL players uh, between, I think it was about six, five or six seasons, uh, between 2006 and 2012. And generally you see that people get back to their previous level of play and don't have a huge issue with this injury in terms of recurrence not like um you know when we talked about acl one of the major issues was recurrence um i think one of the problems with hockey though is there's some research that would suggest the boot itself actually makes people a bit more prone to these injuries uh by nature of reducing the ankle flexibility if they were to fall or turn the wrong way um and puts more strain higher up on the leg which is where those um uh, the high ankle ligaments are but if you look at someone, I mean, like, I was thinking about what is a famous case or what is a common case we would know of high ankle. And, and Jack Eichel did this um, back in 2016. Um, he was out from the start of October until the end of December at that time. And I don't think he's had any issues since then. I've not heard of him having high ankle problems. And um, I'm not familiar with any cases with recurrent high ankle issues outside of people falling and re-injuring it again. So it, that looks pretty good from what I can tell. Okay, and I did lie. I do have one little follow up, <laughs> if you don't mind. Oh um, no! <laughs> <laughs> in terms I'm of uh, <laughs> when he does return, uh, do you feel like he's going to have any issues uh, getting back on his skates? Is this the type of situation where he might need uh, to like relearn and skate a little bit differently, or do you think he mm. would come back and be mostly normal, based on the information we know? Yeah, so that actually is a really, really good question, and I, I meant to answer that when I was um, talking through some of this stuff. So uh, the reason why it's really poignant is because the AITFL, the ligament that's most injured in the case of high ankle sprain, the forces that are put on the ankle when you skate, uh, so if you dig in your inside edge to take a stride, your foot is being forced outwards uh, and also a bit sort of up towards your head. Um, and those are the exact replicated mechanisms that cause the injury. So one of the reasons why it takes a while for people to come back from this is maybe not so much the healing of the ligament itself and the remodeling of the ligament, but the fact that when you go to take a stride, you're going to reproduce the same mechanisms that cause the injury exactly. You can't really avoid it. So I don't know that he has to learn to skate differently as such, but it's going to be a longer process in terms of how, when is that ligament ready to handle the strain um, than something else, you know, whether it was a low ankle sprain or, or some other injury. So, yeah, it's, it's a good point to make, and it will certainly impact how quickly he comes back. Awesome. We appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to let Rick ask a few questions in regards to Cole Caulfield now. Well, we're going to let the, the, the listeners ask questions. And, and last week, on last week's episode, um, Canadians <coughs> Connection podcast, uh, 273, we said we're going to be talking with Dr. Stephen Morris, our medical consultant for Rocket Sports and, and uh, the Canadians Connection next week. Please, uh, listeners, send in your questions. Uh, and they sent them in via text, 5853 Rocket, sent them in via email. Uh, lots, of que- lots of different questions. Um, some about uh, just the man games lost and, and um, why did. Why, do the Canadians keep experiencing injuries given all the off-season changes? Uh, there are some questions about neck neck protection that's been in the news. What happened to RHP? That was <laughs> that was a question, <laughs> um, and uh, a, a number more. But ninety-five percent of the questions um, in 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 um, in our email basket and and in uh, <coughs> our text uh, on the text line is what's wrong with Cole Caulfield. Um, what's wrong with Cole Caulfield? And I think um, our listeners hoping for that there was some medical reason um, that could be pointed to. Um, and, and, you know, we fully understand why it's, why it's a concern, why it's a, a topic of, of conversation. We think back to our own podcast and, and how we, we, I think um, we felt the excitement from, Fans who were thinking that in a full season, maybe Cole Caulfield would be approaching the 40 goal mark, maybe even the 50 goal mark. And, you know, for the Canadians, um, the last time there was a, a 40 goal scorer, Vincent Damfus in the 1993-94 season, the last 50 goal scorer, um, Stefan Richer. Um, so this is something that was 
maybe in a season where there was low expectations, this was going to be something to look for. And, and you know, the update we have today is that he has seven goals in hit 29 games um, and is just on pace for a 20-goal season. So, um, you know, what's the reason? What, what, is, what is the reason why hasn't he been able to score at the pace that, that he was setting last year when his season was cut short? And we know that on the 21st of, of January, the Canadians made the announcement uh, that his season was over. It was, it was something that was almost, it wasn't a surprise because we knew that um, Cole Caulfield was, was suffering um, and he was going to require surgery to repair his right s- his shoulder. Um, it was, it was, there were incidents that we saw in Nashville and and in Dallas where he was in obvious pain, um, from, uh, falls or hits uh, where his shoulder was affected. Um, so the decision was made and, and I think, um, it was the team and the doctors convincing Kolkoff that he didn't want to shut down the season, but they made the wide wise decision to shut down his season had surgery in early um, February, um, and just um, make sure that he was ready for this season, the season that that we're in. Um, and I think the the first place to stop, the first place to land, the first place to turn it over to you, uh, Stephen, is is um, we heard uh, we heard initially that uh, Cole Caulfield was talking was um, experiencing a shoulder separation and. You know, there's, there's our listeners have some, um, especially if they've been in sports, have experienced a shoulder separation, know what that is. Um, but it came out that that isn't what um, happened to Cole Caulfield. He had a dislocation um, and he had multiple instances of shoulder instability early that season. So what's the difference between a shoulder separation that we know about or many of us know about and a dislocation? Hmm. Yeah, it's well. We were talking before the show, Rick, about how um, I also heard the same thing, and um, I hear a lot of that type of discourse. And I think it's good to just clear it up because uh, it, it's nice. I mean, it's not going to be the first dislo- dislocation for sure, and it's not definitely not going to be the last. So, the difference is in a dislocation, um, you know. And I guess to start, maybe it might be good to just say like, what are we talking about when we talk about the shoulder? So. The shoulder is thought of as this ball and socket joint where the ball is uh, the top of your arm, the humerus, and it fits into the socket um, of the shoulder, which is the glenoid fossa. Um, Of all of the joints in the body, it's the least stable, okay? And that's sort of for a reason because it has a wide range of um, of motion, so you can put it in a lot of different directions, but you sort of trade that off with instability. Um, So the way I think in terms of how unstable this joint is, I, I like to think of more of it as a... Um, as a golf ball on a tee than a ball in a socket. Um, so that should give you some context in terms of what we're talking about. Um, really, when you dislocate the shoulder, we're talking about the ball coming out of that socket or the ball, the golf ball coming off of the tee. Um, it's normally held in place by a series of um, uh, ligaments. So just like we talked about with Alex's ankle, um, there's going to be ligaments. There's going to be um, the, what's called the, the labrum, which is like a, uh, a rimming around the uh, socket of the joint. Um, and there's also a joint capsule as well. There's also the muscles around it. Like, you know, we talk about the rotator cuff and the rotator cuff also supplies stability to the shoulder. Um, so the most common issue is for the, the ball to come out of the socket forward. Um, and that's called an anterior dislocation. And I think, you know, with, with 99% certainty, that's what Cole was struggling with. And the reason being is one, the procedure he had, but two, it happens when you get hit from the side or from behind and it pushes the, the, so- the ball forward out of the socket. Um, the, and you know, if it's go backwards, there's a lot more support. So it doesn't really happen. And only see that in like uh, seizures and electrocution. So it's not really common. Um, so the difference being with a shoulder separation is an injury of what we call the AC joint. The AC joint is above the actual shoulder bit that moves. Um, and it's a fibrous connection between um, the acromion and the, uh, cl- uh, the uh, coracoid process. And really, it just sort of provides shoulder stability. Um, you only see it when people take wax to the shoulder. Like if someone were to slash someone on the top of the shoulder, you get an AC joint injury and a separated shoulder. But uh, it's not anywhere near as common as anterior dislocation, in my view, um, and certainly not what Cole had in this case. 
So in early February, Cole uh, ventured off to uh, the Stedman Clinic in Colorado. Um, the surgery was per- performed by Dr. Peter Millett, um, an expert in, in this area. Um, and Dr. Millett was the same surgeon uh, who uh, performed surgery, sol- shoulder surgery, on Josh Anderson, um, a different injury. Uh, Josh Anderson had a torn labrum. You, you mentioned that the labrum and its function. And um, what we what we now know uh, from uh, Doctor Millet and um, and others is that Cole's surgery was um, called a Latterge procedure, um, developed by the French sur- surgeon Doctor Michel Latterge. Um, and in that that you talked about the socket, it was um, Doctor Millet said that socket was eroded, um, and so had to to um, to the procedure was was this Latterge procedure. So, uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, why that was chosen? Wh- what what happens? And um, um, and 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 describe the the process of of uh, uh, what an athlete might be experiencing. Sure. So, um, you know, just remembering the, the analogy we just used. So you have this golf ball sitting on a tee. Um, um, the latter J, like in summary, is basically to put a block in the front of the tee to stop the ball from rolling off. Um, another way to think about it is it's the equivalent of a curb stop. So when you're going to park your car and you're sort of wheeling forward and you feel the curb stop, your car stops um, and it stops it from moving forward. So basically the latter J in a more technical way is to say that they take a, it's, it's, it's often, a, I think, an open procedure. There are some laparoscopic approach or a keyhole approach, but they have to take a piece of bone off of one aspect of the shoulder, which is the coracoid process. Um, and then they use that bone to become the curb stop in front of the shoulder. So whenever that ball wants to roll off the tee, it bumps into the curb stop and stops. So they're really just reinforcing the front of the shoulder. Um, and as you said, you know, one of the indications is degeneration of the bone at the front. Um, so that would be called glenohumeral uh, degeneration. Um, another one is people who have, in, you know, recurrent instability and dislocation. Uh, and in all of this, um, people can also have concomitant um, glenoid labral injuries. So there may have been an aspect of labral repair with it. Um, you can imagine if you continually dislocate, you could tear the labrum. Um, but certainly the latter J is about basically reinforcing the front of the shoulder. So the ball stops rolling off the tee. That's that's a, a great way of explaining it. Um, what may have surprised some people is how quickly that uh, Caulfield was back to a level of activity. Um, he was on the ice without a stick uh, for a bit, uh, but he was excited uh, when he finally got the go-ahead to golf. And I think he got the go-ahead to golf before he got the uh, go-ahead to shoot pucks. Um, to talk about that his his rehab process uh, over the summer. Um, so I think like with with rehab of any injury, it's it, it starts as early as possible. I know from working um, in orthopedics in hospital, like when we do uh, knee replacements, hip replacements, we try to get people walking the next day if you can believe it. Wow! Um, and it's because the the outcomes are so much better when you start moving early. Um, and so with Cole, his rehab would have started on day one uh, and it would have started with just passive movements. So someone helping him move the shoulder through the range of motion. And gradually you sort of go through this, what's called graded process or progress um, through stages of passive to active movement. Um, and eventually you start putting some strain on the shoulder and see if it can handle it. And you get the muscles around the shoulder more stable and you let the, the areas that you've manipulated remodel into what we want them to be. And that can take months, you know. Um, but in terms of being able to golf instead of play hockey, for example, I think part of it is probably, um, the, the actual mechanism of that movement. So the swing and the strain that it would put on the repaired joint, but also, you know, if you look about what we were talking about of why it was done, it's about anterior dislocation. And I guess any sort of risk of even incidental contact of pushing that pushing that shoulder forward and having a recurrence of the dislocation or interruption of the bony graft that they put on um, is too high risk and they might not have been wanted or ready for that. Whereas golf, they're more willing to accept the risk. So I imagine it has to do with the mechanism of the swing, the force placed on the front of the shoulder, as well as the risk of contact. 
So now the big question, and coming from our our listeners, uh, and um, as, as some some uh, of our listeners made the connection that Josh Anderson shoulder surgery can't score. Um, Cole Caulfield <laughs> shoulder surgery he's he's off pace, and and um, I think um, his his volume he's getting his shot volume is really high this this season. Uh, but his shooting percentage is way down. Um, 2021-22 uh, shooting percentage was 12.2%. Last season, it was 16.5%. This season, uh, 6.7%. So, um, you know, his goal pace is down, his shooting percentage is down, even though he's getting uh, the same volume of shots. So uh, our listeners are wondering... Um, did the surgery have an effect on, on his power, the velocity he was able to get off? Did it have an effect on his accuracy? We know that, that, uh, he's, he can place a puck where he wants to at when he's in peak condition. Um, or, or did it, the shoulder surgery have, um, potentially have an effect on his release time? Um, Mm. those are the kinds of, of, of uh, questions that that our audience is most interested in. Yeah, I mean, look, I think if I could answer the question of what is wrong <laughs> with Cole Caulfield, I'd be making a lot more money than I do right now. But, yeah. you know, to, to be fair, like when it comes to shooting I th- and answering this question, there's a lot of ways to look at it. First of all, you have to understand shooting mechanics, what's required, um, and you also have to understand what's happened with the surgery and how it affects that. I think we'll probably stick to the latter in terms of this discussion, but understanding on the whole, I mean, it's such a dynamic process, the, the you know shooting and then shooting within a game and shooting with people in front of you and goalies and all that sort of thing. But to stick to the operative side of things, I mean, look, for me, the biggest concern here would be, you know, around his power. That That's my... That's what I think. And I think the reason for that is a, f- uh, a few things. Number one is the, the shoulder is the primary mover of the arm, right? Like without your shoulder, that's where you're generating the the force um, to actually move the arm forward uh, or flex the shoulder. Yes, you have bicep. Yes, you have wrist. And those are all key aspects of a shot as well. But shoulder is the primary mover. It also is the translation of torque from the torso. So through the hips, up to the, up to the torso and into the shoulder from you know when you actually turn your body and generate force from your legs so it's it's a key cog in all of this in addition to that um you know if you if you feel like after a surgery you're having you're worried about subluxation which is basically a um a really quick dislocation feeling and then it goes back in um or you actually feel that your shoulder is unstable you're not going to shoot as hard and so there's those concerns there one one thing about the shot power and why I lean towards that is even Josh Anderson, seven months post surgery, he actually was quoted as saying he felt like he didn't have that strength quite yet. So if anything's going to linger, that might be it. Um, and for those reasons, now there, are, to say that there are some damning statistics. And I mean, you you just pointed out his shot um, percentage, and it sounds like you and I have done some of the same math before um, coming on here today, and that was certainly one of them. But There's a very interesting study, which you pointed out to me as well, which is um, it looks at 29 players who had uh, glenoid glenoid, um, labral surgery over a 20 year course in the NHL. Um, Now, these people didn't we don't know if they had ladder J or not or or anything, but they definitely had labral surgery and we can put them all in the same bucket, I think, for argument's sake. These players, uh, in terms of the three main categories being goals per 60, points per 60 and shooting percentage, all had a drop off in the first year of their surgery. And on average, the goals per 60 and points per 60 dropped off by about 25%. Um, The shooting percentage dropped 2% absolutely. So from about 10.5 to 8.5. The the good news is that they found in the study is that about three years later, everyone sort of started to even out. So it it took some time for them to get back into the swing of things. Um, And certainly when you look at Cole, I mean, he's gonna be playing for more than three years from now. So we think that that'll probably be a good thing. Um, but let's take a breakdown of how Cole will compare into the study and, and what we would expect. So looking at his, his shot percentage, you already pointed out, it's gone basically from 16.5 to 6.3, 6.5. So it's dropped off by 60 some odd, 65% over the year, which is, you know, pretty damning. Mm-hmm. Um, his, his goals per 60 is down 72%. 
and his points per 60 are down 45%. So he's, he's you know, nearly double what would be expected from the research um, in, in all of those categories. Uh, but, you know, if you're trying to address my primary concern, which is his power, I've looked at his NHL stats, uh, his NHL edge stats, and year over year, he's shooting the same top speed, basically, which is about 88 to 90 miles an hour. He's um, shooting on average the exact same, 55, 56 miles per hour. His shots in the 70 to 80 miles per hour range, which he does four times more than anyone else in the league, uh, than average in the league, um, are the same. And he's also hitting 80 to 90 miles an hour four times more than the average, which is similar to last year as well. So, you know, that actually reinforces that power isn't an issue. So then you go, okay, so it looks like he's still shooting all right, and he's definitely getting chances. His shot volume's high. So for me, when I look at it, I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can blame his surgery, his power for the issues that he has. I mean, no one was worried about a surgery causing him shot problems in the first four games, seven games of the year when he had three goals and nine points. Um, I think it's it's now that we see it change. We start looking for reasons why. Um, I think you know we've seen good outcomes from these surgeries, and we certainly see people return to their NHL careers. So there's and and you know if anyone watches the Habs, you know there's probably a lot more going on than. Um, how Cole's recovering from his surgery and why he's not scoring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and the one thing I took from that uh, uh, that study was that a little bit of patience is it may be required uh, for players to mm-hmm. get back to their top level. Um, the last question I'll ask you here about Cole Caulfield. Well, I'll, I'll ask you a, in 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 a general question about all uh, post surgical athletes. Um, maybe just to to talk about the. Uh, potential psychological effects um, of having surgery and and returning to the game, returning to a, an elite, high level, uh, intense uh, game, um, and perhaps the fear of being injured again. And um, you know, Marty St. Louis last week was asked about Cole and and uh, what what his observation was, um, and he generalized the he took the question and and made it general for all of his players. Um, and he said, uh, get to the inside that Caulfield, along with all the forwards on his team need to, to the, get to the inside of the ice to have better shooting opportunities, better oppor- opportunities for high danger chance scoring chances. And, um, that's how, that's how he, uh, phrased it. But, um, having been through, uh, that surgical process and recovery, um, you know, is there a sense of doubt? Is there a sense of not wanting to put yourself in, in, uh, in the dangerous, uh, dirty parts of the ice um, again? Yeah, the um, you know, Rick, it's always funny. Like when I think about these questions, and I, I think about how I would answer them as um, you know, someone with this sports science background, and like just the fan that watches the game. <laughs> um, and so I'm <laughs> sort of. I'm thinking about Cole and like that comment about he needs to get to the inside of the ice, and I just wonder like has Cole ever been a player that gets to the inside no. of the ice to score? Yeah, I don't know. No, like, yeah, I see. Um, yeah, so in terms of directly answering that question in his context, like I don't know if that's really an issue because he ne- it's not like he used to play that way and now he hasn't gone back. Um, he just doesn't do that because he's always had a lethal weapon on the end of his stick that he can score from any angle on. Uh, but it's a great question and it's a really really interesting thing to talk about especially because you know we've got Alex we've got Cole we've got Kirby all these guys getting injured and and how's that going to actually affect them I mean the easy thing to say is look when you have an injury no matter who you are professional athlete um, guy that works on an oil rig uh, a gas station attendant it doesn't matter when you have an injury especially at work um, you're worried about recurrence and that's you know that's just human nature and psychology and it's going to vary different you know, person to person in terms of how resilient we are as people, our own psychological experiences, our support networks, how we rehabilitate from injuries. Um, so that's a, that's a huge part of it without doubt. But what I want to what I want to address here is maybe the thing that we miss a little bit um, and the thing that I see a lot in my work, working with people who, you know, because essentially have a workplace injury. And that's what this is. You know, Cole is an NHL hockey player. He got hurt at work. And it affects, um, or, or same with Kirby, same with Alex, and it affects their interaction uh, and their actual day-to-day life. So with these workplace injuries, and whether it's the NHL or, like I said, the guy that works on the oil rig, um, it, it's associated with a raft, of, a raft of factors that complicate it outside of the injury itself on your psychology. For example, 
you're taken out of your day-to-day -day routine. You know, you have you have this purpose in life that you wake up, you go to the rink, you do your morning skate, you see your friends, you have a good time, you have lunch, you know, you, you have you go through the video and that's what you do is Monday to Friday, you have your routine. When that's broken, your life is completely different. And if that's broken for months, it takes a big toll on someone. Um, it, it can be isolating, uh, it can drive loneliness, um, it can fuel low mood, low uh, having anxiety, and even prolong recovery and um, returns to work. In addition to that, you know, pro athletes specifically are defined by their contribution. Well, I'm sure that they define themselves by their contributions on the ice, um, their drive to win uh, and be competitors. And by not having that, you know, they may fall short of meeting their own psychological needs. Um, whereas you or I probably don't have that same um, internal mechanism where if we're not scoring 40 goals a year, we still feel pretty good about ourselves. Um, you know, whereas maybe Cole, Cole or other people wouldn't. Um, so thankfully, though, when you look at the Habs lately, um, you notice that guys like Kirby are actually around the team, even though he has yes. a season injury injury, which I think is like hugely important. And I don't know if enough people really recognize that. Um, and not only that, but he has a probably an incredible support network through the through the org organization where, you know, he's got a physiotherapy team. He, he could have access to a sports psychologist. Um, and so he's going to feel like he's still part of something while he goes through it. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, I think with Cole and, and with any of these guys, when they come back to work or when they come back to hockey, there's going to be that process of that's different for everyone of how, how long until they're ready to really get back to what feels normal. Um, but I really don't know if going to the middle of the ice is what Cole needs to do as <laughs> much as just, you know, just keep a rabbit's foot in the back pocket or something like that. Yeah, we didn't see much of that when we went to see him in Wisconsin. He was a perimeter player, but did it exceptionally well. Um, it was a great point about uh, about uh, being involved and being around the team members. And uh, Michael and I talked about that la last week on the podcast, seeing the hospital visits. Both Kirby was there, uh, Alex Newhook was there. Um, and as you say, really important uh, that they have a, a support system and, and have some sort of normalcy to, uh, to their day. Um, listen, um, I, I'll, I'll turn it over to Michael, uh, but uh, I, I'm really grateful to have you here again. Um, Stephen, that was terrific. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, we appreciate all that uh, expertise and a uh, nice touch there, adding uh, the driving uh, sound effect with the car while you're talking about having a drive. I appreciated that one. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm sure our listeners all appreciate this too, and we appreciated getting all the questions and comments from our listeners. I know our Rocket Sports Media teammate, uh, Mike Raschel, has been very excited for uh, having you back on the podcast. I was very yeah, excited shout out, too. Shout out so. to Mike Raschel. Shout out to Mike Raschel. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so we appreciate all that. Uh, please, uh, to our listeners, uh, keep sending in your questions. If you have any further questions for uh, Dr. Morris, uh, you can text us 5853ROCKET or reach out to us on our uh, email. If you have a little bit more to say, hello at rocketsportsmedia.com. You can also check out uh, all of our posts at thn.com slash Montreal. And with that said, I think now is going to be a great time to get to our final break. Stay with us. This is the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. The Canadians Connection is proud to be a partner of Rocket Sports Media, digital media publishers of sports and entertainment websites. Their mission is to build a worldwide network of sports fans who are informed, engaged, entertained, and connected. Learn more about RSM, its team, and its portfolio of brands at rocketsportsmedia.com. I bet you enjoy sporting your best Habs jerseys, dressing up your kids and pets in the cutest Habs gear, and showing off your decked out hockey cave or fan ink. Well, don't just show your friends, show your Habs. The Rocket Sports Media team wants you to boast your finest pictures for our global network of Montreal Canadiens fans. Include the hashtag ShowYourHabs when posting your fan photos on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Then log on to ShowYourHabs.com to see your entries, along with photos and posts from Habs fans all over the world. A proud member of the Rocket Sports Media Network. If you're a business owner looking for the perfect platform to reach a targeted audience of customers, Rocket Sports Media is the solution. 
Our global hockey community provides unmatched social media reach to an attentive demographic of sports and entertainment fans. We can provide visibility to your company, helping you to engage and leverage this prime group of potential clientele. In addition, we also offer sponsorship opportunities for fan events and featured areas of website content, giving you name and logo recognition. Visit rocketsportsmedia.com to contact us regarding this unique marketing opportunity. For the most trusted source of news, analysis, and features about the Montreal Canadiens, log in to thn.com slash Montreal, your year-round source for anything Habs-related. That's thn.com slash Montreal. Welcome back to episode 274 of the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. You can follow at Habs Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can check out the website canadiansconnection.fm. Also, feel free to text us anytime via the Rocket Sports text line 5853ROCKET. That's 5853ROCKET. And great interview there with uh, Dr. Stephen Morris. We appreciate him uh, spending uh, that time with us. A little bit difficult to arrange with him all the way out in Australia. It's a little bit of a time change. Yeah, but he is worthwhile to have on the the um, podcast. And what I like is that um, he has the medical background uh, and um, you know a bit of a sports background to be able to ex- explain things in terms that that we understand and that are our listeners can understand. So uh, we appreciate you uh, reaching out to us and and sending us your questions. And some of those questions will be used in follow-up visits, um, future visits uh, uh, where Dr. Morris comes in. Absolutely. So Rick, I think it's been, it's been a pretty difficult uh, season to follow Montreal Canadiens. And uh, well, the good thing new is there uh, we have everyone covered. Uh, We have all of our Montreal Canadiens coverage all in one place. Just head over to THN.com slash Montreal, and that's where you can find everything and anything you need to know about the Montreal Canadiens, uh, from our game day content uh, to feature articles and prospects. That's your best source to find everything Montreal Canadiens. And if you like things multimedia, uh, head over to our YouTube channel. We have plenty of new and great content there. Just search at all Habs. You can pull that up. Hit the subscribe button. Throughout the week, we put up a couple different things. Uh, We'll start with uh, Amy Johnson's shows. Uh, The first one being the Habs Hockey Report show. This latest episode entitled Arbor Jackai Speaks After His First Week in the AHL. And I think our viewers really like this one because this one hit a lot of views. I think over 6K at this point. Uh, So big congrats to Amy Johnson on that. And a big thanks to everyone that tuned in and uh, watched that video, listened in. Uh, Hit the like button if you like what you saw. Uh, uh, Leave a comment, hit the subscribe button so you never miss a single episode. Because Amy puts these out every single week and you're not going to want to miss a single one of them. And I think I'll I'll just add, if I can, um, that um, yes, there's been a ton of Habs fans who've watched that video. Maybe you're one who hasn't yet seen the video. Uh, so you better watch um, to see what uh, what you're missing. And uh, there's been a ton of comments, too. So you're going to want to get involved in the, the uh, discussion. Uh, leave a comment, respond to a comment, leave a like, uh, and most importantly, subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel. Of course. And also, Amy hosts the Rocket Hockey Report show. So that's all about Laval Rocket, Montreal's AHL affiliate. The latest episode entitled Riley Kidney Makes uh, for a Fly, uh, Jack Eye Debut, Belzeal Returns. Uh, you'll want to tune into that to get all your uh, Laval Rocket updates. And like we said, if you like what you saw, hit that like button, leave a comment, uh, get into the discussion. Amy loves to engage with everyone. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. Also, this podcast is now found on YouTube in the same channel, the Canadians Connection podcast. Last week's episode entitled Habs Trade Targets, Who Stays, Who Goes. Uh, You'll want to tune into that. uh, Make sure that uh, you uh, watch that video, too. Amy does a great job putting together some graphics for that. Uh, Leave a like, leave a comment, hit that subscribe button as well. 
And uh, Rick, uh, we started doing some live streams on our YouTube channel as well. Last week, we did it for the game against the Pittsburgh Penguins, myself and Gustav. And well, we have another one coming up on Monday, December the 18th with myself and my Rocket Sports Media colleague, Nathan. Uh, We had a ton of views so thank you to everyone uh, that tuned into that and watched the game with us uh this was a crazy game 12 rounds of the shootout uh, against uh, the pittsburgh penguins and uh, we're hoping to have some more fun on monday night what uh what a fantastic debut uh a ton of fun you know if you're tired of gary galley turn down the volume on the the tv uh turn uh go to youtube and and turn up the the volume uh, with yourself. Uh, last time it was Gustav. Coming up, it's it's Nathan, um, and participate in the chat. The fun thing, yes, this was a, a, a tremendous debut because it went to uh, twelve rounds of a shootout, and the the audience just kept growing. Um, but I've said for years, Habs fans are everywhere. Well, uh, certainly proven right on that night because um, we had. Uh, Canadians fans joining us from all over uh, Canada and the U.S., but also uh, there was fans staying up late in Norway, in Ireland, in the Philippines, um, and participating in the chat. It was a great time. Um, If you want to have that feeling of watching the game with other like-minded Habs fans, uh, you want to you want to show up to our live streams on our YouTube channel, and you have a chance this uh, this Monday um, to uh, join in. That's the game with uh, the Canadians uh, visiting the Winnipeg Jets. Absolutely. Looking forward to that and looking forward to seeing you all in the chat. Uh, Also, if you haven't already, make sure that you subscribe to the premier Rocket Sports Radio podcast on your favorite podcasting app, The Canadians Connection. You can find all the episodes at canadiansconnection.fm if you ever missed any. And uh, that way you can catch up on all things Montreal Canadiens. We'll be here every single Saturday. We don't go on vacation. Uh, We're here all throughout the summer. We're here all throughout the holidays. So you don't want to miss a single episode of that. And uh, next week we have another very special guest coming up. And that's one Patrick Williams. He's the AHL guru, or at least I call him the AHL guru. He knows everything there is to know about the AHL, follows it, and has been following uh, that league closely for um, years and years and years. Uh, He will be joining the show uh, to talk about the Laval Rocket and the other things going on with prospects in the AHL. And uh, listen, you, you sent us a ton of questions for Dr. Steve uh, this past week, uh, do the same. Send us some questions about the Laval Rocket, about prospects, about the AHL uh, for the AHL guru, Patrick Williams, who will be joining the show next week. Absolutely. And looking forward to that one. Uh, so now it's a good time to get to our Canadians Connection question of the week. And to our listeners, we say, did you say 40 goals? How about can Cole Caulfield hit the 20 goal mark this season? Uh, we want to hear from you what your thoughts are on that one. Uh, you can reach out to us uh, via text at 5853 Rocket, or uh, you can reach out to us on social media at Habs Connection on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And Rick, if people have a little bit more to say, uh, they can email us. We have an email address it is hello at rocketsportsmedia.com. Hello at rocketsportsmedia.com. Absolutely. We get tons of uh, text, tweets, emails, and comments throughout the week. Uh, We look forward to reading through all of those, and uh, we really appreciate everyone that takes the time to send us their thoughts and questions. And just again, uh, thank uh, everyone for sending those uh, questions in. Uh, Last week, we had questions um, about neck protection, making it mandatory. We had questions about uh, trading players before they get injured. Uh, Monaghan, Savard uh, were names that came up. Uh, there was uh, one question, what happened to RHP, <laughs> which, um, which we didn't get to, but, um, we will respond to them. Um, and, uh, fans were wondering, you know, why do the, conti- uh, do the Canadians continue to have, uh, injury issues, uh, after all the off season changes they made to personnel? Um, so those, those questions, we're not forgetting about them. Uh, they'll come back and, um, and, and. When uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Morris visits us again, and uh, we'll deal with those and and, uh, perhaps other issues at that time as well. Absolutely. And it's going to be a busy week before we come back uh, for our next episode on the 16th tonight, uh, Saturday. uh, 
the New York Islanders are going to visit Montreal. Uh, they get uh, the Sunday off, but they're back in action on Monday in Winnipeg. That's the Rocket Sports live stream. So head over to our YouTube channel to join Nathan and I for that. Uh, on the 21st of December, Montreal visits Minnesota. On the 22nd, they visit Chicago. So a pretty busy week there and a mix of different talent. Yeah, and um, we should say that after the, the Islanders game, uh, the Islanders game is the last uh, home game of the calendar year for the Montreal Canadiens. Then they go on their traditional um, holiday uh, road trip. Uh, so they'll be on the road trip uh, on the road for the rest of December. That's going to be a wrap for us today. Thank you all for listening. Uh, make sure that you're subscribed to the Canadians Connection podcast in the player or on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Uh, you can also share it on social media if you like what you heard. Enjoy the week, and we'll be back here next Saturday, December the 23rd, for another great episode. Uh, I feel like Amy Johnson hasn't done enough work lately, so she'll be filling <laughs> in the next two weeks for me as I uh, head out on uh, my Christmas vacation. Uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, this is the Canadians Connection podcast here on Rocket Sports Radio. Click subscribe so you never miss an episode of Canadian's Connection. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Rocket Sports. <laughs>